They are elected by you. I am elected by you. I'm constrained as they are constrained by a system that our founders put in place. The founders separated power because they knew it was the best way to protect our citizens. They didn't want one person, one man to have all the power like a king. We show by our work that free people can govern themselves. You can't pay lip service to the Constitution without obeying it. Keep your eye on the ball. Structure is, uh, structure is destiny. This is Necessary and Proper, the podcast of the Federal Society's Article I Initiative. All views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Society. Hello, this is Nate Kazmarek. Welcome to Necessary and Proper. We are here in the national offices of the Federal Society in Washington, D.C. And today I'm looking forward to a great conversation with our guest, Dr. Kevin Kozar. Kevin, how are you? Very well. Thanks for having me here. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We're looking forward to this. I thought I'd just orient the audience uh, to get started as to your background. Earlier in your career, you were a lecturer in policy and public administration at New York University and Metropolitan College of New York. You were an analyst and research manager with the Congressional Research Service. How long were you there? I was there 11 years. 11 years from when to when? 2003 to 2014. Great. And after that, you joined the R Street Institute, where you are a senior fellow and governance project director. Kevin is also the author of several books, including Failing Grades, The Federal Politics of Education, Whiskey, A Global History, which was published in 2010, and Moonshine, A Global History, which was published last year. You've been a Presidential Management Fellow, and you've won the Academy of Wine Communications Wine Writer Award. Um, Most recently, you co-authored a new book with Adam White and Oren Cass. That's titled Policy Reforms for an Accountable Administrative State. And Kevin's chapter in the book is titled Reasserting Congress and Regulatory Policy. I look forward to discussing that a little bit later. So you mentioned you're originally from Ohio. What uh, originally brought you to D.C.? Well, um, I was finishing up a Ph.D. in politics at NYU and casting about for jobs. And I also was committed to not being a political science professor who had never worked in politics or government. Um, That seems to be an unfortunate trend uh, in recent decades. Uh, And I didn't want to do that because I knew the best professors I had, guys like Lawrence Mead and Joseph Vitteridi at NYU, they were people who worked in government and also had the Ph.D. So I was looking around for opportunities to get into government, and the Presidential Management uh, Fellows Program uh, was my in. I applied, got in, and got offered a spot at, at CRS. Excellent. And again, you started there when? Oh, gee, September 8th, 2003. Excellent. And maybe you could... Uh fill in for our audience a little bit more about the CRS. Uh, talk about, if you would, um, you know, for those that are not familiar with the agency at all, um, an overview of the agency, why was it created in the first place, how long has it been around? Sure. Um, the Congressional Research Service is a nonpartisan agency inside the Library of Congress. It's been around for 100 years. It's staffed by civil servants, so these are people who are not turning over when you have a turnover in Congress. Uh, They're not appointed on the basis of of partisanship or anything else. Uh, It's advanced degrees and credentials and all that sort of stuff that gets you into CRS. And their job is to serve as the institutional memory for Congress. Um, One thing that is difficult for a lot of folks to appreciate, I certainly didn't get it, uh, not fully until I showed up here, is that Our Congress is a representative body. You know, it's us. It's we the people. It's people who've sold cars in their lives, who've worked as small town attorneys, who have done all sorts of stuff. And when they arrive at Congress, suddenly they're being told that they are in charge of a $4 trillion government, Mm -hmm. one with its, you know, reach all around the globe. Nothing has really prepared them for that responsibility. And these folks turn over pretty regularly. So how do you get those folks up to speed? 
Well, one way is the Congressional Research Service. They have folks who stay there for decades and who know issue areas and know how, you know, parliamentary procedure and Congress works. Uh, they know just about everything under the sun, and they are there as a resource to help members get up to speed. So that's what the CRS does. It's got about 600 employees down from the 900 it had about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so it's shrunk a bit, but uh, it's still a real important place. And how is it structured? Is it is it structured by topic or you know area of expertise? How is the, the organizational structure? Well, it has um, kind of five big divisions. One division is the information specialists and reference librarians. These are the folks who can find just about any fact that you can ever imagine. These are the people who know the insides of the library with its bazillions of books and holdings. They know where to find everything. And, and members of Congress tend to look for just about anything you could imagine. <laughs> um, then there are four other divisions that are kind of broken up roughly by issue area. There's an American law division, so they do legal work on every topic you can think of. There's foreign affairs division. There's a government and finance division where I hailed. Uh, and then there's the resources, sciences, industry division, which deals with you know, science, tech policy, uh, manufacturing, that sort of stuff. Okay, and, and while you were with CRS, where, where did you find yourself and what was your responsibility while you were there? I was tucked in the government and finance division, and I was in a section within it, a 10-person section called the executive branch operations section. And we basically were the experts on bureaucracy. Uh, so one of my colleagues, she knew everything about federal uh, employee law and practices. Um, I covered a whole grab bag of topics like government privatization, uh, quasi-governmental organizations, government corporations, uh, classified information policy, government advertising. Uh, it's one of those things where the longer you're there, the broader your <laughs> portfolio frequently tends to get. Sure. And... Um how did your day-to-day -day work break down? Were you answering calls from staffers and members of Congress constantly? Were you working on more long-term projects, sort of anticipating what might be coming down the pike for Congress? Uh, in the early part of my career, uh, my work time was probably split 50-50 between reactive research and proactive research. Uh, reactive research being, you know, you come into work and you find a message on your voicemail saying, this is somebody so from Congressman so-and-so's office, and I want to know this by such and such time. Boom. You drop everything. You got to get it done. Mm -hmm. Versus me thinking, you know, Congress should probably look into this topic. It's been bubbling around for a while and sitting down to research and write a report. As I went through my career, um, I became much more of a reactive researcher um, there was one year where I had over 660 requests from Congress. Um, I mean, it was just constant people asking me about one thing or another. And so that made, um, made it harder to do the deep dive projects. But still, if a deep dive came in, you just had to make the time. Mm -hmm. And do you have a sense of why there were so many more requests towards the end of your career there as opposed to when you first started out? Part of it was getting better known on the Hill. One of the neat things about working at CRS is when you write something, your name goes on it. That's different from, say, GAO, where their stuff is produced by team and they might list somebody as a point person on it, um, but it's not an analyst-driven author environment. So folks knew me on the Hill in a few issue areas, and a few of my issue areas also just serendipitously were getting hot. Um, but I think the agency also um, was kind of smarting under the uh, effects of the Internet age. Mm. Um, it is so easy for anybody in the American public now to reach out to a member of Congress. It's virtually cost-free. It used to be you had to sit down, write a letter, get a stamp on it, do all that sort of stuff. Now, you know, you go to a website, you type in a few, <laughs> few things, and you click send. Uh, and particularly with the advocacy websites. Those, uh, you know, things where it's like, show you support HR such and such, you know, just click your initials in here and click send, and it sends an automatic 
uh, note to Congress. Well, that, those correspondences are pouring into Congress. Congress doesn't have enough staff to handle all that stuff because it mm-hmm. comes in by the millions. Mm-hmm. So frequently they outsource it to CRS. Okay, so the volume that you were receiving in terms of requests uh, increased dramatically from the outside world, so to speak. Um, and at the same time, um, how were the staffing levels? Were the staffing levels at CRS you know, responsive to the increased demand or? No, over the, my tenure, there was a, a atrophy of the number of full-time employees at CRS. Um, it was, uh, it's the agency's down um, from 900 employees in the mid-90s to about 600 now. And um, we also lost a lot of people who retired. Um, CRS became the Congressional Research Service in the early 70s. Um, the CRS that we know today. Mm -hmm. Um, In response to the Nixon presidency and his overreach, we had all these interesting things happen in the early 70s, Congressional Budget Act, um, and the staffing up of CRS and turning it into kind of a full think tank, that happened then. So you had a whole bunch of new hires in the early to mid-70s. Well, guess what? 30 years later, it's... 2005, and all those people are hitting 30 years, and they're going, well, I can retire. So many did. I recall at one point looking at the uh, roster of my 80-page division, and I looked at it when I first got to CRS, and then I compared it just before I left, and something like 70, 75% of the people I started working with were gone. Mm. Um, So that was a lot of institutional memory that went out the door. It was just a demographic bubble. Um, and and at, at the same time, the administrative state is growing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's two trends going in the opposite directions, and it's uh, not not good for our democratic republic. I see. And perhaps you can characterize what the largest challenge you felt uh, was uh, working at CRS uh, as the years went on, just for you personally. Well, I... Um, The idea of CRS is that you are supposed to be an expert and you're supposed to give the most accurate, best possible answer, which implies that there are some answers which are less good and some answers that are probably not worth giving at all. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what what an expert means, coming to judgment. And unfortunately, over my tenure there, the concern grew amongst upper management that we don't we don't want our analysts having anything that could be construed as an opinion. Well, where's the line between opinion and judgment end? Um, it's not at all clear, but the pressure came upon analysts that you started to have your, your in your research papers and things that you wrote for Congress this sort of wishy-washy conclusions. Mm. Um, even if the evidence pointed clearly in one direction, you were supposed to kind of do the, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. Critics say, uh, you know, supporters declare, blah, 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 um, which, A, degraded, you know, how you felt as an expert, but B, it also kind of made our documents less useful to Congress because ultimately people who work on the Hill, they want to come away with a conclusion, even if they don't fully agree with it. What they don't want to do is spend time reading a white paper and then put it down and go, I have no idea what that's advising me to do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, and w- what was that in response to? What, were, there, were there instances where members of Congress were calling out people at the CRS for being too political? Or was there a perception going on that, that uh, you were taking, that, that had too much of a voice and need to pull it back? What led to that outgrowth? Well, you know, anytime somebody writes something for the Congressional Research Service, even 50 years ago, there's bound to be a member of Congress who gets annoyed about it. Um, Mm. It's just the sheer math of the situation. Uh, And annoyed about it because these are partisan individuals who are, you know, have a very strong viewpoint and they're Mm -hmm. coming up against analysts or researchers who maybe are not necessarily spinning it one way, but have an opinion that maybe doesn't meet with theirs or that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes you raise facts and others find them inconvenient because it means the sort of things they've been saying out loud and uh, waving their arms about 
um, no longer look quite right. I see. Um, so that's a perennial problem, the challenge between kind of politics and expertise. And that's always been at CRS. Where it got exacerbated was uh, with the internet. Well, when I first started at CRS, we had a very simple website. Um, and we also had, kind of as a vestige of the way the place used to work, a room on the second floor of our building, the Madison building, which had printed copies of all our reports. And congressional staff who wanted them were expected to kind of walk over and browse through the various sections and take the reports they wanted. Mm -hmm. So what that meant is our reports were not particularly widely distributed. Then the internet comes, suddenly PDFs of all our reports are floating around everywhere. And you have bloggers coming out, you have media who never previously wrote about CRS reports chiming in on them. You have television shows. I had stuff of mine show up, on, you know, being waved on like hardball and other places. And that creates more politics. Mm -hmm. And then you get members of Congress or congressional staff coming to CRS and saying, well, you don't like that report, da, 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 da. The agency um, wasn't quite prepared for that. And unfortunately, kind of started to crouch and try to hide from the we don't want to do anything that will upset anybody. And that's where the pressure came to make your reports more boring. I see. Make them, make them so bland that nobody could possibly see anything in them that would upset them, which, of course, reduces their intellectual utility. I see. And prior to that, uh, prior to the Internet age and these reports being more broadly shared, was, was the media regularly in contact with people at CRS to ask questions, to get up on an issue? Um. Based upon what my older colleagues told me, um, there were media contacts with some analysts. Some analysts are just, they're not interested in talking to the media at all. I see. Um, they don't think it's worth it. They don't think it's part of their job. But other analysts had good relationships with media, and they like to kind of liken their position vis-a-vis -vis the media as, you know, kind of almost professor to student. Um, you know, a media person picks up some topic that they have to deal with, some complex separation of powers issue or something. Here's a guy who will give you 30 years of background knowledge on it so that you, the reporter, don't make a dumb mistake or misframe the issue. Um, very, very useful to reporters. Um, and so that's always been the case. It's just oh, now yeah. you have broader media inquiry because of the Internet age and the ease of, of sending emails and... Yeah, that was, I mean, it was very different back then. You had paper copies and you had person-to-person -person meetings or telephone calls to discuss your reports and to discuss the content and the larger topic. Very different from some blogger, who knows where, picking up something you wrote and not contacting you and then just writing some flame post upon mm, it. I see. Um, and can you tell us... Um, what are you most proud of from your work when you were there? I'm sure there are many things, but if you could nail down something in your top five or... Oh, geez. Um, there were so many good experiences there, so many good experiences. Being called by members of Congress directly into their office, treated as an expert and asked to give your candid opinion on a particular thing, that that's very gratifying. Sure. Being called to testify, which I, I did a couple of times. How many times have you uh, testified before um, Congress? At CRS, I testified twice. I've also testified since coming to R Street. Great. Um, being, tr you know, having staff who didn't know me personally, but by virtue of working for CRS, just trusting me and bringing me into meetings where they were looking for witnesses for hearing and helping them craft questions. Just being pulled into that sort of stuff. Um, it was really it was remarkable. It was absolutely remarkable. I can't speak with specificity, issue specific. Sure. Um, just because CRS does its stuff privately. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. And uh, I'm curious if there are ways that you have in mind that uh, the CRS can be improved in terms of making recommendations to Congress? 
Yeah, most uh, first, I would think that each uh, each chamber would uh, be advised to have some sort of rule that they adopt as part of their rules package or something like that, which basically says, don't kick the nerds around, <laughs> even if you disagree with them. Um, just to remind folks that these guys are here to help you be smarter and that you know, gratuitously bashing them um, is not felt helpful. And it moreover just perpetuates a media story anyway. So just resist the temptation. That would, that would help. Uh, certainly people would feel like they're less under siege there. Um, second, CRS is inside the Library of Congress. And unfortunately, it does not have real independence. It, uh, its hiring procedures are based on Library of Congress hiring procedures and are astonishingly bureaucratic and astonishingly costly. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that is one thing that should be changed because the work of an analyst is very different from the work of somebody who, say, is shunting books for the library or something like that. I would also say that... So direct hiring authority from the people who have experience in the area and who would know best who, who, who could work for the, uh, the agency well. The, I mean, the agency has direct hiring authority, but the procedures it has to follow are just unbelievably baroque. I, I mean, see. it takes months, months to get somebody hired there. Right. Uh, and, and in that time, someone who's applying for those jobs is likely turned off by the experience, and they may go somewhere else, right? I mean, that, <laughs> that only adds to your challenge as an as a mm -hmm. agency, I would think. Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, I think uh, the agency would also benefit from being uh, encouraged to hire folks on kind of long-term contracts as opposed to making them full civil servants uh, with lifetime tenure, which is the way it works now. Um, you know, let's be honest, issues come and sometimes issues go. And so to have the flexibility to bring somebody on when an issue suddenly surfaces, mm -hmm. um, you know, staffing up for terrorism, uh, staffing up for health care. If you're an agency and Congress has limited the FTEs you have, what are you supposed to do? You can't fire people. You can't force people to retire. Um, it's kind of hard to well, respond. They just have to make guys like you an expert really quickly, right? <laughs> yeah, and in some cases that's that's doable, um, but for a lot of issue areas, you know, especially healthcare, economics, you just can't retrofit somebody to <laughs> to, to do that sort of stuff. So, right. and sort of lastly on the CRS, where does it fit within the budget? I mean, what time, if you know off the top of your head, what what are the type of numbers are we dealing with in terms of? Yeah, it's sure. Size. It's um, the agency is about a uh, hundred and six million dollars per year, and so that covers its six hundred ish employees, and that's a number that's been uh, been flat for some time, and unfortunately, per 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 capita employee cost rise mm -hmm. um, due to factors that are frequently outside the agency's control, which sure. of course means less money. Uh, to hire people. So from your perspective, your vantage point, it would be advantageous to bring on more people, increase staff, and to increase the budget there, and you would get pretty good bang for your buck? Is that your perspective? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I certainly think that the, um, the procedures for removing folks for suboptimal performance uh, need to be toughened up a bit. Okay. And I mean that both with the analysts and the managers. Mm -hmm. um, there are some people who are you know, recognized within the agency as not doing a very good job, but good luck getting rid of them. I see. Um, that also should be switched. But yeah, with the executive branch growing so massively, new regulations, new this, new that, uh, with members of Congress so busy with so many things, you need to have people whose job it is to pay attention to government and to report upon it. So why did you end up leaving the, the CRS? Um, yeah, it was a peculiar thing. I was um, on the cusp of being a, a 
pointed to permanent management. I had done some temporary stints in management. Um, I, I was doing great there. But uh, I found myself doing a lot of outside writing for things like the Weekly Standard, doing papers for academic conferences and other sort of stuff that I had to do on my own time. And I was really enjoying that stuff. And I kept thinking, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could have a job where I could do more of that outside stuff that was such a kick. And lo and behold, suddenly there was this new position at the R Street Institute uh, where I'd get to do that. And I applied and, and astonishingly got hired. <laughs> and it's been a happy two and a half years. And in those two and a half years, you've been overseeing uh, three separate research programs. Um, one uh, to modernize the U.S. Postal Service, right? Mm -hmm. And another is to rational, rationalize federal and state alcoholic beverage policies. Mm -hmm. And and lastly, and most importantly for our purposes, to strengthen Congress. Right. Oh. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your work there? I know that's a broad question, and it's over three areas, but maybe yeah. you could touch on each and then talk about Congress a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's. Um when, when friends and family in Ohio ask me about the new job and how it's different, I, I say, well, let's see. I write about government stuff. I frequently talk to congressional staff and members of Congress. I guess the job's kind of similar. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's very different. Um, it's, uh, you know, I certainly do get some requests from the Hill for assistant, but a great, the great majority of my time is me prospectively picking out topics to write about and pursuing them. And um, yeah, I, I was hired on initially to do congressional reform stuff, mm -hmm. uh, broadly, broadly cast. And over time, I've built in these two other programs, the postal and alcohol one. Uh, that, was that work you brought forward from your experience at CRS or those sort of new areas that you're interested in? Yeah, no, the postal thing um, was something I picked up at CRS, utter serendipity. Um, my first boss there during my first meeting, he, me and a new guy, another new guy, were sitting across from him, and he was trying to think of work to assign us. And he said, well, I'm the, I'm the lead res researcher on postal. Uh, I need a backup. Mm. Who, who wants to do it? And the other guy just froze, and I was like, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> and then my boss retired like two or three years after that, so I became the lead on Postal, and uh, I did a ton of work on it. And the alcohol thing grew out of this, uh, this hobby that I got into in the mid-1990s of just being curious about alcoholic beverages. Growing up in Ohio, I was um, aware only of thin yellow beer that came in cans that went off and slammed. Um, <laughs> I spent some time at Ohio State bartending at the faculty club, and I realized that there were better ways to drink and better things to drink. And then I got to New York City, and it was like being turned loose in an alcohol smorgasbord. <laughs> so I started writing about alcohol in my spare time and during graduate school and launched a website in 98 called alcoholreviews.com. And uh, it's always been something I've been doing on the side. So now to be able to you know, bring that into my out of my hobby space and into my actual workspace is, is really something. Well, that's excellent. It's good to get to do things, work on things that you're passionate about. Um, and, of course, as you know, we at the Article One Initiative, we are uh, passionate and focused upon Congress. So I thought maybe we would talk a little more broadly about um, it as, a, as an institution. Um, but from your 10 years of, of, or more of working with them um, and observing how it operates, can you – Share with us your impressions of Congress. Um, it is a a firm, you know, a company, an organization with a lot of uh, 19th and early 20th century structures and processes um, and attitudes built into it, living in a 21st century world. I see. And I think that accounts for part of why it's uh, not held in particularly high public ex esteem. Um, it's I think also, that's an understatement. <laughs> it's, a, it's also one, it's in a really peculiar historical moment. Um, partisan control of the chambers has swung back and forth more rapidly over the last 20 or so years 
than it had at any time since just after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So that lack of stability um, scrambles its operations. It starts turning everything into a two-year play clock, um, and it gives members different incentives. I see. Uh, it's always about playing to the next election. It's about either playing opposition or it's about doing as much messaging as possible. Um, it's, a, it's a strange historical moment. I don't know how long it's going to go, but it, it certainly has disrupted operations. And I would imagine it would have an impact and effect on elected officials, the way they behave, how long they stay up on, in D.C. Um, how, how have the elected officials, I mean, in Congress generally changed over the years? Well, um, they are more and more running against the institution as opposed to being proud of being part of it. Mm -hmm. They accordingly are flying into town on Tuesdays and flying out Thursday afternoons or Friday mornings. They're not making their homes here. Uh, they won't, don't want to be accused of catching Potomac fever or joining the establishment or something like that. Um, so certainly that affects their ability to socialize, and um, it just affects their time on task. Um, they also are besieged by media. Um, the space in which politicians used to operate was much broader. Um, there were state and local reporters who would cover the Capitol, but frequently they were on friendly terms with the member. Um, but they, members today now are in this media bubble where, you know, they're hearing it from CNN, they're hearing it from Fox, they're hearing it from Twitter, they're hearing it from MSNBC. They're just being, they're being forced to respond to just about everything. And by respond, uh, I'm not saying just give answers, but to kind of shape their image. Members of Congress now have been forced basically uh, into the PR business. They may not want to be in it. Some like it, clearly, the show horses. Mm -hmm. um, but others, they just have to do it. They feel obliged to have a Facebook page. <laughs> they feel obliged to get on Instagram and to do all this sort of stuff to shape their appearance before the voters because, you know, it's a basic rule of public relations. If you're not shaping your image, others are. I see. And, and this effect of, uh, you mentioned show horses, is that, are you implying that maybe there are less workhorses, those who are t t dedicated to one or two issues who work for years and years in Congress? It's, has it changed the, the nature of the way these leaders operate while they're here? Yeah, I think there are uh, fewer workhorses. Um, it's, it's hard to be a workhorse when you feel like you have to spend a third or 50% of your time raising money and flying back to the district uh, and meeting with constituents and doing town halls and that sort of stuff. Um, when are you going to do it? Uh, when are you going to take the time to meet with executive agencies and figure out how they work? Um, just not enough hours in the day. Um, it's also the case that, um, and this, this, this is for Republicans particularly, um, this new habit of deciding that people can be chairman of committees for only six years and then they have to rotate off unless they ask for a waiver. What does that do to incentives? Um, I think basically it turns the incentives in a bad direction, which is you get on a committee and then you start thinking, okay, how can I use this committee to step to a better committee? Instead, of, a, instead of staying at that committee and doing the work and, and being committed to a given area? Right. You know, the, guy, the days when somebody like, you know, Jamie Lee Witten were on the Hill and they knew a particular policy area inside and out, um, that's – that's declining. There are fewer and fewer of those sorts. I mean, you still get some. You get, you know, Grassley. Um, you could say McCain on uh, uh, a few others. But those folks are becoming increasingly rare. And right now, it's a it's a strange demographic moment in Congress where 50, 55 percent of members have had eight years of service or less. Um, you have this, so you have this kind of newish core up there. And they're being socialized into this, what, what they think is the normal way of doing things, which is partisan warfare, showing up only part-time, uh, mm -hmm. 
treating hearings as a vehicle for just humiliating the opposition um, or grandstanding. And eh, why do the workhorse stuff um, unless you really personally are passionate about it? You won't, you won't get a payoff from it. I see. And in terms of the staffers, how, what changes have you seen in congressional staff over the last 10 or more years? Uh, congressional staff, uh, for, for members' staff, uh, more, more of them are being devoted to constituent service out in the districts. I mean, the bodies have been shifted out there. Um, more are doing media outreach and constituent response, so that means fewer people are doing policy. Uh, the total number of staff uh, has been flat for the personal staff, and committee staff has actually declined. Uh, and when you combine that with the legislative support agencies like CRS, GAO, uh, also having fewer people, what you have is a weaker, uh, weaker legislative branch. So it's in some ways a similar experience to what has happened at the CRS. And um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned at CRS during the Nixon era, you, the uh, CRS was staffed up in response to sort of a perception that the executive was growing in power, but then it's declined. And so w what are the reasons that the staffing at CRS has declined and also the staffing in uh, Congress has declined at a time when the executive agencies and, br and branches is growing so um, dramatically? Well, it, um, it seems to be driven by two things. First, budget politics particularly, as we know, entitlements are swallowing up a greater and greater portion of the money that's available to be spent each year. Sure. As such, that puts pressure to economize in other areas. So where do you do that? Well, Ledge Branch is an easy place to do that because you're not going to get a huge public outcry. In fact, and this gets to the second point, a lot of members of Congress think the public cheers when they cut their own staff and cut the legislative branch. Um, that was something, you know, Newt Gingrich, when he took over in 94, I mean, he railed against the corruption of Congress, and yes, there was plenty of it, Rostenkowski and all that sort of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, but he took a meat ax to the legislative branch. He whacked the Office of Technology Assessment. An entire agency of brainiacs just got zeroed out. Um, so suddenly, <laughs> the science information and research that they could do for Congress just was no longer available. Um, CRS survived for a time, but then, boom, it started losing people and having its budget flat. And GAO took a huge whack mm -hmm. uh, under Gingrich. And why haven't we seen commensurate cuts in the executive branch? Well, every member of Congress has a program um, or policy that they adore. So anytime you try to zero something out, you've got to fight at least one person over it who's bound to not want to vote with you on some other topic. There are, you know, just name an executive branch program and you'll find somebody who, who loves it and wants to fight to the death to protect it, no matter how inefficient or ineffective it might be. But when it comes to the legislative branch, there are very few members of Congress who are willing to, you know, go to the mat on that because this is a branch that, as they see it, well, the funding is there to help experts and staff and that sort of stuff to help me. What's the direct connection to constituents? Well, A, there's the constituent service part of it, but they think they've got that to some degree triage. But B, there's just the effectiveness of Congress, and that's a long, slow bleed type problem, where as Congress becomes less and less functional, the public gets angrier and angrier. But because it's a long-term thing, um, members just don't feel obliged to fight for it any particular year. I see. And in terms of the partisanship, I mean, that's always an issue, um, regardless of the era you're talking about and, and Congress. But um, can you comment a little bit about partisanship, the polarization of Washington, D.C. And, and Congress and how it's affecting the way Congress operates? Yeah, most certainly the um, average member of Congress, uh, you know, there's been political science done on this as far as their expressed ideology in terms of voting and position taking and that sort of stuff. Folks on the right are moving further right. Folks on the left are moving further left. Um, this is why, you know, Susan Collins and other 
moderates are looking increasingly uh, like in a, the last of their species. Mm-hmm. It's it's also the case that um, members of Congress more and more are paying attention to the loudest individuals out there. And the loudest individuals out there are more and more those who are the kind of the most ideologically strident. Um, there's a guy who runs an organization here in town. He's a social scientist or psychologist by training. He's um, done some research which shows that if you take particular issues like, I don't know, postal reform, something that's been deadlocked for 11, 12 years now, if you take that issue and you put together a bunch of average voters and you give them policy choices, they're going to hash together a deal that's acceptable. So, you know, that speaks to this dissonance happening. But if you only take the people who are kind of ideologically interested in the Postal Service, they can't cut a deal. Sure. And so there's this disconnection between the public uh, and the folks who are governing, and the folks who are governing are paying a bit too much attention to the elites. I see. Um, Lastly, just in terms of your general comments about Congress, do you have um, recommendations that you are pushing for for Congress uh, in terms of funding, staffing, committee structure. Um, We'd love to hear uh, what you're working on at R Street and your recommendations in that regard. Well, um, with our legislative branch capacity working group, which which meets each month on on Capitol Hill, staffers and experts, we're we're first trying to get people to actually think about Congress um, as opposed to treating it as an afterthought or a uh, something that makes them twitch in annoyance. Think about the institution. Think about what would be what would enable the institution to do its job in the 21st century to meet the various citizens' demands and to carry out its constitutional duties. And then see what sort of policy reforms or institutional reforms would flow. I myself have put forth uh, the idea that you know, yes, the legislative branch support agencies, those civil servants who are the extra eyes and ears of Congress, you got to staff that up. Um, inspectors general ferreting out waste, fraud, and abuse, other corrupt stuff, you got to give those folks the freedom to do what they need to do, and they've got to have sufficient funding to do it. I've also suggested that um, Congress needs to really admit to the, you know, lack of balance that's developed between the branches of government, particularly in the area of regulation. A mm-hmm. um, hundred years ago, there were very few regulations issued. Now we have oh, what, 180,000 pages in the Code of Federal Regulations. Regulations get plopped out by the executive branch all the time. There's nobody in the legislative branch whose job it is to pay attention to those, Mm -hmm. to write about those, to call Congress's attention to good ones, bad ones, to run cost-benefit analysis on these things. Why not have a congressional regulation office? Uh, We have a congressional budget office because budgeting is complex. You need experts to understand that. Why not a congressional regulation office? Um, The problem, of course, is when I say these sorts of things, to my friends on the right, they nod and they're like, yeah, more firepower would be good, but no, we can't spend more on the legislative branch. That'll tick off the taxpayers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I say, well, guess what? The taxpayers are already ticked off. They're not impressed with your performance. <laughs> so like continuing to starve the legislative branch and thinking that's somehow going to make things better, you've been trying that since the early 90s, and it's actually gone the opposite direction. So, you know, free up a few nickels because in the grand scheme of things, the legislative branch's budget, which includes everything, Library of Congress, architect of the Capitol, who takes care of the buildings, all that kit and caboodle, it's not five billion bucks, maybe. Five billion. And the total budget's what? Four trillion? Mm-hmm. It's a rounding error. Mm-hmm. Spend more so you can do the public's business competently. And the... Um, um the Congressional Regulatory Office is actually one of your suggestions in your new book with Adam White and Orrin Cass. Uh, what's the title of that book? Is it? 
Oh. Or, or the title of the chapter is Re- Reasserting Congress and Regulatory yeah. Policy. Can you talk a little bit more about the book and then, uh, and then more specifically about how Congress can reassert itself in the regulatory space? Sure, sure. Well, the book takes a um, kind of three-branch approach to looking at the, the issue of the administrative state, which is, is, is quite enormous and which doesn't really square well with our t- constitutional scheme and which has been growing really rapidly since the 1970s. Um, so Adam White has a chapter on kind of a judicial, judicial responses to it. Uh, Orrin Cass has an executive branch response to it, and then I take the congressional angle. And I think um, behind all of our uh, approaches, there's a commonality in that we, we want the regulatory state to comport with the idea that we're a democratic republic, which is laws should be made by elected officials representing the people, and that having government able to kind of rule on autopilot, uh, and that the only way you can stop it from doing something is if you have sufficient funds to sue them, and maybe you get lucky and win in court, that's not the way it's supposed to be. we're a republic. Uh, while we prize policymaking being done well, while we prize expertise, we ultimately need the voice of the people in there. Um, and that's not really what we have right now. I, I was remiss that the title of the book is Policy Reforms for an Accountable Administrative State. It's a national affairs publication. Um, um, one of the things you talk about in your chapter is um, – you know, the difference between um, Congress and the administrative state. And one of the questions I had was, um, you know, some people might argue it's, it's preferable to have experts uh, in their field uh, working uh, in, in, within the executive agencies as opposed to Congress doing the regulation. Um, why is it your view that it's important for Congress to take back control of that? Um. Well, there's the basic accountability problem. Um, you know, your average American uh, business person or citizen, public school teacher, regulation comes out and affects their life, tells them what to do. Um, who are they supposed to go speak to about that? Well, the current system, they don't really have a voice. And that creates a legitimacy problem. There's an awful lot of anger out there in various pockets of the population about this problem of voicelessness, of like government just does stuff and you can go complain to your congressman. Your congressman kind of shrugs and is like, eh, the executive branch did it. I sent a letter telling them, you know, I wasn't happy, but it's done. Reversing the policy is going to take forever. And by the time that happens, if it happens, Mm -hmm. years have passed. Um, that rubs people wrong, and it undermines support for our system of government. People need to feel heard. I mean, if the election of Donald Trump tells us anything, it's that a lot of people feel like they have not been heard. Now, that said, I do not ever imagine a situation where our Congress would sit around and be the actual issuer of regulations. Um, government's too big for that. Um, government's too complex. But I don't like a situation where the executive branch pretty much has free hand to do whatever it likes and Congress is shunted to the side. So your chapter talks about incentivizing Congress to do this work. Um, um, how do we do that? How do we convince Congress that, no, it's, it's really in your best interest, it's in the best interest uh, of, uh, with regard to your constitutional role within our, our society, and um, – and it may lead to increased popularity amongst voters. Well, the, the first thing I've, I've advocated is that members of Congress need to be reminded by everyone that all regulations are local. Even if they were issued by an agency tucked here in Washington, D.C., their real effect is out there where the constituents are mm-hmm. and not to lose sight of that. So. Communicating on that count to Congress is important. Um, I also think, again, with, that we should make it somebody's job to pay attention to regulations. Um, 
CRS, GAO, it's not really their job to do it. Occasionally they write about the topic, and when they do write about the topic, frequently it, it spurs attention in Congress. Uh, all the more so because the reports leak out, go out publicly, and people in the media and other public say, hey, what's this regulation about? And then Congress responds. Uh, so having that happen more often um, would also kind of goad Congress to take responsibility. And again, it wouldn't be somebody's job to do it. Uh, and then I think that Congress needs to think structurally about getting itself involved in the regulatory process. I mean, right now it is involved a little bit in the form of the Congressional Review Act, where it's voting to strike down regulations that are on the cusp of being you know, finalized and taking effect. But that's a kind of whack-a-mole late-use tool, getting Congress to be involved in the middle or up front would be preferable. And that could be done a couple of ways. I mean, many states have legislatures with committees to which regulations are referred as a matter of course. And then the committee has to do something. So that kind of puts them on the hook to either say yay or nay. You can also have something like the RAINS Act, where in really big regulations, things are gonna cost $100 million or more or have $100 million or more effects on the American economy. Congress would have to vote before they actually took effect. And that way we'd get past this game that they now play where Congress pays no attention to regulations, an executive agency goes and writes some big reg, and then Congress yells at them. Uh, that doesn't serve the public well, so. Uh, lastly, with regard to the chapter, you talk about um, Congress's oversight role and how it's not living up to uh, its responsibilities in that regard. Um, and you assert that the power of the purse is key. Uh, why is that? Well, if, if executive agencies don't have the money to a lot to activities, then they can't do it. Um, and so Congress has to get control of the purse so that it can be more directive of what the agencies are doing. Um, we've fallen into this bizarro situation where the new budgeting norm is to not have a budget um, or to adopt a budget that is just nobody believes it's, it's going to hold and then do appropriations at the last second before, when we're on the cusp of a government shutdown or just afterwards and put through a bill that nobody has read and has, you know, funds the entire government or great portion thereof. That just, you know, that's loss of control of the purse. Um, if you have committees who are working on spending regularly, who are specifying where the money's supposed to go, zeroing, zeroing out stuff that's not working, zeroing out agencies or programs that have become abusive or sloppy, then you're going to have a um, budget process that better represents the, the public's desires and also one that's going to be a little more fiscally responsible. But right now, nobody's in charge of the budget. It's just anarchy. Well, on that happy note, um, I just wanted to turn a little bit to uh, some of your other work. We talked about Whiskey, a Global History is a book of yours. Also, uh, Moonshine, a Global History. When when was that out? Uh, it's uh, it's just coming out, 2017. Okay. And where can they find that if the uh, audience is interested? It's on Amazon. It's University of Chicago is selling it, Target, uh, Walmart. Okay, so everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I'd just... Uh, uh, have you try your luck at a little bit of congressional drinking trivia. Um, are you familiar with uh, Tip o former Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill's book, uh, Man of the House? Yeah, yeah, classic. I read a couple decades ago, uh-huh. It's a great old political memoir. Um, in it, he sheds light on a happy hour club that another former Speaker of the House, who you may be familiar with, Sam Rayburn, used to hold in the ca Capitol building. Uh, and... Uh, it's from this anecdote that I have two trivia questions for you. In Tip's book, he wrote that Speaker Rayburn held a regular meeting called the Board of Education. It was an invite-only affair and usually involved influential Democrats and new members of Congress. It was held at 4.30 in the afternoon in an unmarked room on the first floor of the Capitol with a security guard posted outside. According to Tip's book, the point of the meeting wasn't really to educate new members of Congress, but rather to offer alcohol to newly elected officials so that leadership could learn everything about their new colleagues. 
Uh, that anecdote's always kind of stuck with me. I thought it was pretty wild. Uh, but here's the qu- trivia question. Uh, s- former Speaker Rayburn was said to have supplied water, ice, and a bottle of liquor to the congressman. What type of liquor did he offer them? I would think it was bourbon. Was it bourbon and branch was what they were doing those days? Bourbon is correct. And for a bonus question, what brand of bourbon was it? Oh, geez. Back then? Old Taylor? That is incorrect. Uh, it is uh, Virginia Gentleman. And so there you have it. The longest serving Speaker of the House turned to Virginia Gentleman for his intelligence gathering. One of the few bourbons made outside of Kentucky back then. That's interesting. That's right. And wasn't it in Northern Virginia? Um, I think it was in Kentucky and then and then in what is now Reston. Mm-hmm. So that's probably more uh, alcohol trivia than we needed to do, but I thought it, it was interesting <laughs> given your uh, your work in that regard. So I just wanted to offer you an opportunity for any concluding remarks or anything else you'd like to share with our audience. Um, yeah, the one thing I would say is that, uh, you know, Congress is in a bad spot. And I think many, if not all of us, feel a temptation to just kind of write it off, you know, jeer at it. Yeah, they're all hapless. They're all crooks. They're all fools. Um, but if we write off Congress, we write off our democratic republic. I mean, it's the only branch that is directly connected to the people um, through elections, through our ability to just to meet with them um, in person back in our home districts or, you know, coming to Washington and, and visiting their offices. So as much as one might want to despair, don't, uh, don't give up. And in fact, I think the more of us who get in Congress's ear and tell them that this is, this is what we expect you to do. We expect you to govern because the rest of us have our own private lives to run, so we need you to be competently running the ship. The more of us who say that, um, the better the chances are we can turn this thing around. Agreed, and we are committed to that work as well here at the Article One Initiative. On behalf of the Federal Society, I want to thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. Thank you much. Thank you for listening to Necessary and Proper. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend, and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. To learn more about the Article One Initiative, please visit fedsoc.org slash article I. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash article I. This has been a FedSoc audio production.